No questions for Kassar? Go on, Yang. Hello, um, <coughs> my name is Yang George. I'm from Internet Society. And as I'm holding the IPv6 topic inside the Internet Society, um, you said that all these IPv6 goals are achievable. Uh, but I would really like to learn uh, where the region is in the IPv6 implementation activities. What are you working on and, and what, is, what is the strategy time-wise? Because the strategy of using NAT to delay the inevitable is a possible strategy, but I would really like to learn where, where the region is with, with implementation of IPv6. Thank you. Although there is interest in IPv6 adoption, it is obviously slow. And uh, the way to handle this is to have a collaboration between the market structure itself, whether regulators, service providers, or stakeholders, or end users. Um, I recall, for example, in the, e in the EU at a point, uh, they set up a goal that we need, 20 we need to have a 25% of IBB6 uh, adoption in, uh, across the EU region. Uh, I don't know whether that was, uh, that was achieved or not, but we need to set a target like that. Of, well, a more realistic target, not necessarily 25%, but we can say in this time period, if we reach 5% or 10, and then we move to that level. I guess this is the right approach. Uh, but uh, currently, it's a slow, and currently we are mostly in nothing, and mostly using, as I said, as I mentioned, the present, an exhausted resource. It is an exhausted resource. Thank you very much. If uh, I just, Hamid Al Bashir from um, ICT Qatar. That's it. Uh, I'd like just to also, uh, as a follow-up, uh, comment to the question. I think there's some work been uh, currently being done on IPv6 because government re regulators started to uh, um, identify in uh, IPv6 as uh, as an important uh, migration and step to 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 move ahead. For example, in uh, in in Qatar, where we're publishing uh, a national IPv6 uh, strategy, and you know, as well there's a national IPv6 uh, implementation plan that will be agreed with, uh, with stakeholders soon. In Oman as well, they have a task force. Uh, IPv6 task force in Oman is very active. In UAE, they also have a task force, and I think they also work in. So there's, there's, a, there's a push from government and regulator. But I think uh, the operators are, uh, are the key key stakeholder to to uh, to facilitate things. Uh, some op uh, operators see their current uh, IPv4 pool is sufficient and see nothing as the solution for them. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a good strategy. But uh, yeah, I think it's also the business by pushing uh, the operators as well on uh, the from the demand side that might be uh, uh, a workable solution. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Ali Shumali from Zing Kuwait. Um, just to reflect on the IPv6 question, um, currently all the operators are considering an IPv6 strategy. Um, it might not be government mandated, but let's say the explosion in uh, V4, uh, 4G traffic from w we once started, NAT is no longer sufficient. Um, speaking on behalf of Zain, Zain is actively migrating to IPv6 as we speak and we have a very key strategy how to move to V6 within the next year. May, may I ask what is your target? Do you have a, a specific target? We did a comprehensive study of the handsets, uh, the devices on our network, 
and that's what's guiding us towards our uh, V6 strategy. And also there's a, a question of security to, uh, to also be addressed, to be honest. Uh, once you remove the NAT, there's a lot of nasty things that can happen to the handsets. So this is something we're also uh, looking into and considering, and we're actively engaging in, in, in this matter. Happy, happy to hear that. And uh, all what I hope is that when we read the next right NCC annual report, we will see a higher graph for IBV6 in the region. And I hope we'll see a few Kuwait also. Happy to hear that. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much to our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. So I've kind of ended up in this dual role of <laughs> leading the conference as well as um, giving one of the presentations. So um, the MENOC program committee um, worked for, I think, several weeks to try and persuade me to actually present about some, some of my experiences over the last 20 years of internet development and what I'd learned and without making it too self-indulgent, um, what I'd really been, been up to. And I don't know, I've always been struggling to think, well, why this would be interesting to anybody at all. <laughs> I mean, it's, it makes a nice story when I'm trying to give an example during any of the, the workshops or the training that I've been doing over the years. But I think a few people had heard a lot of these stories and was like, well, can you not just join all these into some kind of slide set and, and maybe share it with a, a wider community? So. Um, I've tried to put something together. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to be useful. Um, it's certainly been very, very useful for um, a lot of the experiences and the workshops and, and training and so forth that I've been helping internet operators with, with over the years. Um, so where did this all start? Well, I got involved in the internet really in about 1989. I think I was the typical student that got sidetracked by this internet thing. Um, it really started when I was completing my PhD in physics um, when I was at university. I suppose it even started before then, 1987, 88. Um, because we had a Unix system um, in our lab which we did um, a lot of the processing work that um, I had to do for my, my research. And of course, being a Unix system, it had things like TCP IP in it. And that was still pretty new then. It had an Ethernet port on the back of it. And it was kind of, well, what do you do with all this, this stuff? And so, yes, I got a little bit sidetracked playing around with all this. The early versions of TCP IP, I got my own, own Class C address from uh, some chap in the US whose name I um, don't really remember anymore. But um, that type of thing really got me very, very interested in how all this network piece worked. So much so that when the engineering department decided that um, a new TCP IP network was required, that um, I should help setting all this up. And you know, I joyfully did all that with all the old technology. You remember the thick ethernet? The cables were about this big and they were yellow and you could only tap into them at certain points. We did all that. Um, and then it just got more and more involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, so much so by the end of my postdoc, um, I became really the computing officer for the combined engineering and physics department, looking after the computer aided design lab and a lot of the department public Unix servers. So it all kind of grew like that. So I knew a little bit about bridges and there was this scary thing called a router that our department had and I kind of worked out how that functioned and so forth. So I very much caught the internet bug it's kind of fortuitous because that was the time the UK was going through the whole cutting back of research money. Um, the engineering, uh, sorry, the Science and Engineering Research Council at the time had really, really massive budget cutbacks and there wasn't really any more money for me to carry on doing uh, my postdoc. So that was kind of lucky. Um, 
And so the job choice really, when I came to the end of the postdoc, was become a university lecturer or join the commercial world. And I still remember my head of department trying to persuade me that the commercial world was a really bad place to be in because there were things like targets and competitive pressures and, well, the university is nice and comfortable and you can come in every day and you can do a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, so it was a very, very persuasive um, argument because, you know, I'd been used to the student life and it was, you know, no real deadlines or anything like that, apart from having to do um, a PhD, which was pretty serious deadline in those days. Um, but, you know, I chose the latter, take a bit of a plunge. And it was quite interesting. It was a few months earlier, I'd finally managed to compile a Usenet News. Anybody remember that? Usenet News? I'd managed to compile the software on my HP workstation. I was delighted. I was what, one of the first people who'd ever managed to do it because it was written for Sun. And, um, and we got the Usenet News feed from the computing center. We'd got one from Edinburgh University and started looking for jobs, and there, UK.jobs, was ad this um, ISP was advertising, this ISP called Pipex, looking for a network engineer, so I thought, well, give it a go. I managed to do the department networks, surely uh, in ISP can't be much different. Um, for some reason, they gave me a job, <laughs> so started there in 1993, and the first task was, well, first big task um, was really, well, We've got all these dial-up customers, and we've got all these modems scattered all over the room, and we've got this new rack. Um, can you just do the upgrade? You know, just swap them out. So it was pretty much something like this. You know, it's taking all these standalone modems, and and we remember that. Okay, it's a US Robotics, but it was a Miracom, is what it was before. Um, swapping this in and swapping it out. So me being complete physicist, just well, I don't know, it's a very good example for a physicist, I was being completely practical. So, okay, they said, swap out. So, took all the Miracom standalones out and put the rack in, plugged it all in, yep, done. Uh, did you test? Well, yeah, I tested, made sure that my modem talked to the rack and it all worked fine. Well, what actually we found out that this was really, really early V32 bis. It only just come out. And of course, Miracom's V32 bis didn't work awfully well with anybody else's V32 bis. And what we found also that other people's V32 didn't work awfully well <laughs> with the V32 bis. So, yes, it was my first real lesson um, of do a lot of testing first. Don't just try your modem in the same office using the office PABX. Actually, go home and try different modems and make sure you can still dial in. But it was a very easy way of finding out that vendors' promises and specification sheets often didn't completely match reality. Because um, V32 bits, if you look back at the ITU specs, the V32 bits was very, very early. And V32 was still to the fore. Um, and there still is this early 14.4 kilobits per second and, and so forth. But that kind of had me on the guard. So you come in from university, you don't really realize that marketing literature is not 100% accurate, that it's actually marketing literature as opposed to the real facts. So that was, yes, as I said there, wishing to be back at university because, oh, university was so good because you didn't have to worry about this. Um, so that was really the first lesson. And then, well, the next one that still sticks with me even today and all the training I'm now doing, um, in those days, BGP is only for experts. You don't want to touch it. You might break the internet. So I just watched as the BGP expert in, in our organization did all the BGP bit and cursed about the protocol and about Cisco and Wellfleet and all these people. I learned a little bit about IGRP and how that worked and BGP version 3. Um, if you know your BGP version numbers, yes, in 93 it was version 3. It was fully classful. Um, BGP version 4 only came out in 1994. Um, so I knew a little bit about it, what it could do, and the fact that it could break the internet. So that was my introduction to BGP. Um, April 1994 saw the migration from classful to classless BGP. I mean, that was when it happened for us. Um, we had Cisco beta software. I mean, nowadays, you look at your business and you say, I'm only going to run mainline, well tested. I'm not going to put beta software on my network at all. That's the guiding principle today. Back then, it was all beta software. It was pretty much Cisco would spin another version of iOS that you would download and put on your, on your router. 
Generally, if you went to something like an Internet Engineering Task Force meeting, you'd meet Tony Lee and folks like that, and they say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fix this for you. And they'd log in, do it, give you an image there and then. And you would run that in production. Um, nobody would do that these days. But, you know, that's the sort of thing we did. So an early beta Cisco software had BGP version 4 in it. UUNet were using it in the US. They were pretty happy, or as happy as they could be at the time. And so that was our um, motivation to switch over to, from BGP version 3 to version 4. And again, I remember those days my boss came in and was like, big day today, Philip. The internet could break or not. And it was literally just changing the version number in BGP. And of course, the difference between the two, two protocols was that version 3 assumed classful routing. Version 4, you had to include the net mask with everything that you announced. And so all that we really had to do was announce our aggregate. That was the brand you changed that could break everything. Um, and of course, it all just worked and there was no real issue at all. So I was kind of getting a little bit suspicious about this BGP could break the internet and so forth, because we found the whole internet didn't break. And most of the internet, at least as far as I was aware, had migrated to classless routing by the end of 1994. So really 1994 was the big swap over from classful to classless. But of course the classful days had left a lot of a mess behind. Um, there were still large numbers of class C's being announced because up to then people were getting class A's, class B's, class C's. And when the internet had run out of class B's, or was getting close to running out, ISP's got chunks of class C's, which they announced like that, like 32 class C's. So there was all this pressure from, well, the CIDA report, which Tony Bates had started about that time, to try and get people to aggregate these class Cs into, um, say, slash 20s, 19s, 18s, and so forth. So that was the CIDA report. And as you hear later on, I think I'm talking again today, is the CIDA report has grown into something way more than the early efforts to get people to aggregate the announcements. And of course, the other thing was, and I've still got the scars on the back of my hands. Upgrading those AGSs and AGS pluses from 4 meg to 16 meg of RAM just to accommodate the routing table growth. If you look back on the side report graph off to the left hand side where it was going up like this, I mean it was going up much steeper then than it, than it is now. The router vendors made buckets of money out of, I don't remember the price, I mean, I mean, Nigel will be around at that time as well. It was some silly amount of money, like 10,000 pounds or something, just to upgrade from 4 meg to 16 meg of RAM. And you got virtually nothing as a trade-in credit. But I mean, those routers were really agricultural, you know, opening the cover and pulling the fronts off, and they're all sharp edges and so forth. So I still have the scars on my hands from dealing with, with those boxes. But I still like them in some ways. Of course, the ISP in 2013 has never had it so good because in 1994, 95, I mean, IGP was fully meshed. No such thing as a route reflector or confederation. Routers at 60 meg of RAM these days, 4 gig, 8 gig, 16 gig, depends who your favorite vendor is. Customer BGP announcements could only be changed during maintenance outages. So my alarm clock was set 4 a.m. Tuesday morning to clear BGP so that our customers could get announced to the internet. These days, we've got right refresh and all the rest. Um, BGP table took most of the available RAM in a router. I mean, I still remember, you know, 200K free. And then Cisco came up with us, oh, well, you need like 20% free, otherwise the table fragments. Well, sorry, 60 mega RAM, 200K free, please tell us what you can do. And so there was very, very big pressure at the time for aggregation and not um, overdoing the routing table. Sean Duran in those days at Sprint did great service for the internet by really having some aggressive filtering um, for his customers and peers and so forth. Um, it's just a shame that no operator will take the same aggressive stance as he did, but they probably could get away with it in the same way that Sean could back then. And of course, people still don't understand what IGPs were for, IBGP, EBGP, and all the rest. We didn't have anything like BGP communities and so forth. But you know, there were improvements. I mean, I think again, in those years, 94 through 99, were the major improvements that we see to BGP today. If you look in, say, the last 10 years, very few things have been changed in BGP. A few tweaks here and there, but nothing like the big changes we saw 
from 94 to 99, right? BGP was still fully matched, overloaded CPUs, and that meant a major US ISP backbone uh, melted down. I think it was like 65 routers, they added the 66th IBGP fell over. And it wasn't just a case of removing one router and it all came back, they just shut off, I don't know, a third of the network, something like that, to get the mesh back. So BGP Confederations was the quick hack that came in to fix that. And so you see some of the ISPs from back those days, 95, uh, late, late 94, early 95, and now have a confederation set up. Whereas a year later, IETF got involved, wrapped reflectors, and that's pretty much what the rest of the world are using to scale their, their BGP today. Of course, you know, I was young and foolish then, and we thought, oh, wrapped reflectors, great. And so we just migrated our whole network in one to our maintenance slot. That was, well, that was crazy. I mean, I'd never ever done a route reflector before. I was just going by Cisco's manual. And you'd think I would have learned from the Miracom experience, but oh no, no, we just did in one to our maintenance slot. We were very lucky that it all just worked. It all just worked. But you know, certainly nowadays I would never ever recommend anybody just converting the whole network from full mesh to route reflector in one to our maintenance slot. So that was the second lesson. Um, Testing, testing, planning, testing, and phase it properly. Don't just plunge straight all in. I suppose those are the early days, young and foolish. Now, Kasai mentioned uh, in internet exchange points. So this is our experience, and Nigel probably recognize half of this as well. Peering with the enemy. So this was, well, it wasn't the enemy as such, but that's the way our salespeople presented it. When they found out that we were talking about an exchange point, it was like, you've got to be out of your mind. You've got to be crazy. We had our own paid capacity to the US, cost a small fortune. Um, we had a paid connections to eBone, I think it was like a two meg link to eBone, cost even more than the link to the US. And we got the European routes, which were not very many, or at least not enough. And then we also had SwipNet, which was uh, one of the ISPs in Sweden. Um, these were very, very expensive links. So we had all the amusing things of, well, we were in Cambridge in the UK, if you know the geography. Um, one of our competition hosted, um, I think it was the Sun website for Sun OS, Solaris, and so forth, three doors down the road. Trace route between the two went via the west coast of the US. This wasn't very good. It was actually faster to get a tape, go down the street, and get the update than it was to try and FTP it. So interconnecting with the UK competition, who in those days were UK Net, Demon, and BT Net, was pretty much considered selling the family jewels. The sales folks were really unimpressed because it would just kill the sales growth, it would lose business, and we'll go out of business and it'll be the end of it. And it's interesting, you know, this is, what, 20 years ago, 19 years ago, I've been involved in setting up so many exchange points over the years, and this is the first argument I hear every single time. And I say, but look at links now. Ah, oh, yeah, but that's different. You don't understand. <laughs> ah, well, I do understand. Um, all the arguments are RTT, round trip time, quality of service, customer complaints, the extreme cost of international bandwidth, logic, common sense said it's the best thing to interconnect to your competitors. We did have a link to Janet, which was a UK academic network, because they had lots of useful things like FTP sites and Archie. Anybody remember Archie? They had all that. And so we had to connect there because our customers wanted access to some of that stuff. So that was the birth of links. Um, logic, common sense, RTT, QS, finances prevailed over the sales folks' fear campaign. And it was actually the technical leadership of the five operators met. It wasn't left to the, the big bosses. Well, actually, the big bosses and some of these were involved. It was very much the technical folks left. Uh, sorry, were involved in this and agreed the exchange point was needed. We looked at SE gigs, you know, the Swedish, the D gigs there in Sweden, and that was already operating. And there were three Swedish ISPs all quite happily interconnecting, and it was all working. Of course, you know, I, again, one of the things I remember was each ISP wanted to host it. Um, you know, we, I don't think we particularly cared, but UKNet definitely had to be in Canterbury. Demon wanted in their offices somewhere in London. BT said, oh, well, you know, we've got this great place in central London. And Janet, well, you know, let's hope put it at, um, where was it? Was it UCL? I don't remember. It was, it was one of the, 
uh, universities in London. Let's put it there. And we actually suggested, we suggested, somebody suggested it goes into Tally House. And that's, that's a recent picture of it, but that's pretty much the building, which is in the east end of London. Tally House is another story. It was a financial disaster recovery center. It was absolutely nothing to do with internet at all. I remember some of the early meetings with um, the European directors at, at Tally House, and they said, we want to put a point of presence in here for internet. I'm like, internet, what nurse that? Um, they took a lot of persuading that they should host an internet organization. Well, they wanted a couple of recs. We needed somewhere else to put um, a data center in London because that one that we did have had very, very difficult access um, in all senses. Um, but they were, they were disaster recovery for the Lund city of London financial markets. They had complete replicas of all the trading floors and everything else. And so the early Tally House was trading floors in a tiny data center. And those of you who are in and out of Tally House today, whichever building, you know it's just like data center wall to wall. And pretty much it was the turning up of links at Tally House that converted Tally House from being a financial disaster recovery to the business they have today. They should remember that. So success, we got the UK peering going. Links was established in Tally House London, five operators, four commercial, one academic. The first fabric, now this is funny, was an ethernet hub. I'm not joking, it's an ethernet hub. We had, in Cambridge, we'd really taken the hub out of our pop because it was starting to lose packets about three megabits per second, so we bought one of the early, early Cisco Catalyst 1201 switches. I found this picture on, um, on the net. I was quite impressed I managed to find one. Um, but if you've ever been to the, was it the Science Museum in London? The link switch is there. I've never touched and used stuff that's ended up in a museum, but now I have, and that's a bit frightening. Anyway, so, you know, so we got the, we, the Pipex Ethernet hub went into the link. So there were two hubs. They started losing packets at about three, three um, megabits per second. So then a 1201 switch went in. And as more providers came, a second catalyst went in there. I think we connected them together by FIDI or something. Third lesson, peering is vital to the success of the internet. Um, and what was ironic, the sales took off. I mean, it wasn't like doom and gloom, because the argument, of course, to any folks worried about loss of business is, think of all the potential business that you can make, because your customers are now all having very, very fast, unrestricted connections between each other. Right? Customer complaints about round trip times and QoS all disappeared. Um, and in fact, we found our traffic across the exchange point was comparable to our US traffic. So Lynx was actually critical in creating the UK internet economy. I mean, this is just some of the examples. Microsoft data center was UK based, much to the annoyance of UUNet in the US who thought they had the global contract. But actually, Microsoft said, well, you know, we'll, we'll go into London. There's a Lynx there. And they got connectivity to the Lynx via ourselves and, and BTNet. Um, what our sales guys didn't like was we lost all our resellers because our resellers no longer needed to get transit from us directly. They could all go to Links and interconnect. So they peered at Links, they bought their own international transit and so forth. And you found that there were smaller ISPs, international operators, and the content providers turned up. I mean, there were a few rule changes that Links needed first, but that was by and large what had all happened. Peering is vital to the su success of the internet. Um, interior gateway protocols, well, IGRP was Cisco's classical interior gateway protocol. Migration to EIGRP was pretty simple. But then the next one I did was my next foolish mistake. Well, not really a mistake, but yeah, well, so EIGRP is Cisco proprietary, and while well, we've got other equipment that's not made by Cisco, we need to run something that um, other vendors will support too. So let's move to OSPF. Um, so practically it's easy because the protocols have different priorities. But in reality, um, it wasn't quite so straightforward. <laughs> um, because OSPF has a higher distance than EIGRP, you can deploy OSPF and the network will still keep running. What you should not do is once you've deployed OSPF is just yank out EIGRP and hope that everything works. So that's what I did. We did a this all over a weekend. We turned up on Monday and the customers were phoning in like crazy because almost nothing really worked. 
Fourth lesson, migration for, to an IGP needs to be done for a very good reason, with a documented plan. We didn't have anything like that, I suppose, again, young and foolish. Back out plan, leave the old one running, just in case the new one um, doesn't work very well. What it actually resulted was we moved from ERGRP, which was a working, scalable IGP, although it was proprietary, to OSPF, which was really going through its worst phases as far as Cisco was going because it was so many bugs, so many things had been added to it. Um, the OSPF rewrite that Cisco was doing was still half, half a decade away. They did a rewrite in um, 2003. So this was still um, a long time away. And of course, UUNet then had a closer relationship, were very close to um, buying us. And of course, they were using ISIS. And when they found out we moved to OSPF, it was like, are you guys out of your mind? So, and the reason, of course, for ISIS, I mean, we're looking back to like 1996. The reason for ISIS back then was, well, don't really know. It's a bit peculiar, only Sprint, UUNet, and one or two others were using it. But of course, these days, it's now a protocol independent um, routing protocol. And what I'm finding is that most ISPs who are deploying v6 are abandoning OSPF in favor of ISIS because ISIS is carrying both v4 and v6 address families at the same time. So, you know, it's again, it's another learning lesson. Redundancy. This one's hilarious as well. We had two links from the UK to the US, Cambridge to Washington, London to New York, running on separate undersea cables. Well, that's what British Telecom told us. That's what Cable and Wireless told us. And it's a long story about guarantees, maintenance, undersea volcanoes, cable breaks, and so forth. I mean, I don't really want to go through those. There were so many of them. You know, being the network engineer, being responsible ultimately for the UK infrastructure, um, being the last point of call and so forth, you find out all the different tales. But the fifth lesson was make sure that critical internet, international fiber paths are actually fully redundant. Don't just listen to what the providers actually say. It's important that they don't cross or touch anywhere. I mean, and literally cross or touch anywhere. If they're going through the same conduit, um, they're, cr they're touching. Because, you know, there's so many issues of, yes, yes, it's independent fiber, they're not touching, but they're going through the same duct out of, say, Telehouse, or, or they go from the, on the same, alongside the same train line between, what was it? I've forgotten, somewhere in Bristol. And the train came off the tracks and cut the whole thing. So it's stuff like that you need, really need to be, be aware of. Also, make sure they're restored after maintenance. <laughs> we had classic case of maintenance on, what was it, TAT 11, and we got diverted on to PTAT or something, was one of the cables across the Atlantic, where our other, other circuit already was. We never got moved back. And so when there was a major outage in the, uh, in the Atlantic, I think a volcano in the mid-Atlantic ridge erupted. Um, well, we lost both cables, and we had both British Telecom and Cable and Wireless into the office said, right, how come both broke when they're meant to be about 5,000 kilometers apart? Ooh, um, uh, well, it's probably your equipment. <laughs> and it actually turned out after a lot of, well, threats and so forth that um, they actually had forgotten to move the, our circuit back onto the cable it was meant to be on. What else? Aggregate origination, given I've got 10 minutes left. I mean, there's, there's so many issues here. Aggregate origination, generally aggregates within the backbone, not, in, not sitting on the Washington router. Well, that's what we kind of did, bit of a mistake, because when the, both the transatlantic cables failed, <laughs> um, the Washington router was still announcing our address space. We could send packets out, nothing came back. Trying to get somebody in the US to turn off routers on the 5th of July morning is not straightforward. They've all had a very good night the night before. Sixth lesson, originate aggregates in the core. How reliable is redundant? Now, oh, telehouse folks will remember this. When somebody tells you something 100% reliable, it's probably not. I mean, the building was very, very impressive. You can go there today and you see it fiber access in opposite corners, blast-proof windows. They had a moat in the front of it to stop reflection from blasts and so forth. Several levels of access security. I mean, they boasted about the security. The funny thing was the main security guard was from Aberdeen, where I'm from. 
And I could just turn up, and I was like, oh, yeah, hello, we'd talk about this, that, and the next thing. Oh, you want back into your usual room? Yep, no problem at all. Nothing. That was it. Easy access. Even after I left Pipex, I was kind of, I bet I could just go in there and get into access to any room I wanted. <laughs> but anyway, they didn't hear that. Yes, three weeks of independent diesel power, external power from two different power stations, all fine until they did maintenance on the diesel generators. After the maintenance, they switched the wrong circuit. They actually switched off the external power. The whole bit, well, half the building went off. And of course, they realized the mistake when lights started going out, so they switched everything back on again, and the resulting blew up a lot of the UPSs and a lot of the power supplies and a lot of people's equipment. And of course, it was news headlines on the BBC, UK internet switched off by maintenance error at Telehouse. Didn't actually affect us too badly, um, because on our bigger routers, we had dual power supplies, and we actually plugged one supply into the UPS, the other one into the dirty mains. That was pure, pure luck that we'd done that. And so even though the in-room UPS had failed, when the external mains power came back, our routers came, all came back. So once the physical infrastructure got going again, we were okay. But it was really difficult to stop the sales folks from being smug about it. Because like, yeah, yeah, we see, we're super redundant network, you know, we had all this, the other guys didn't. But because something else could quite easily happen. Seventh lesson, never believe that a totally redundant infrastructure is. Two of everything is really important. And those of you who have been through various tutorials of mine, I say commercial aircraft have two engines, at least, for a very good reason. I could mention bandwidth hijack, but I'll jump through this because I'm taking far too much time. I've only got, um, we want to stop by 11 o'clock for the, for the break, so I'll just jump through this. So the short, sharp shock. It may have only been five years from 93 to 97, but those are probably the most compressed learning experiences ever. And those learning experiences have really, for everybody who's gone through it, have really done a lot to contribute to what the internet is, is today. Um, I mean, the folks I know from those years um, had to learn so much so quickly, um, really from having not a lot at all in, in the early 90s to a very, very fast-growing commercial internet in 1998. And of course, there are a lot more than eight lessons. I've only given some of the highlights here, but there are a lot of others. So moving onwards, UNET's global business, it became all money, money, and, and so forth, and it was time to do something different. So um, Cisco seemed a good place, joined the consulting engineering group, very much to give the vendor some idea of how ISPs operated the internet, what the ISPs actually required. I mean, this was really the request to come and join and, and do. And so I thought, yeah, great, I can get all these Cisco IOS bugs fixed, and I can get all these great new router platforms that we need, but they're not actually making for us. Big mistake. Vendors have committees and all the rest to try and figure out what's best for the customer. And so when you actually provide input that's reality, they don't wa really want to listen because it doesn't line up with roadmaps. So my role instead became very quickly one of infrastructure development. Oh, you helped set up the links, you helped do this, you built this ISP and so on and so forth. Let's try and do it somewhere else in the world. Um, because the 90s were such formative years, um, the account teams around the world very quickly realized that this was useful, great way for selling product and so forth. Um, so working with a colleague, we started off doing these um, Cisco ISP IXP workshops. And you know, we have the kit there. At that crate traveled around with me for several years. And it's too dark to see, but that was, that was actually one of the first workshops I did with the UNDP in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, but you know, we, we taught a lot of things like IGP, BGP design, best practices, a lot of the new features. A lot of people still hadn't realized what the new features were. Covered the ISP network, covered what an ex exchange point was about, and encouraged the formation of the IXs, introducing latest security best current practices, and the early introduction to V6. I actually had deployed V6 in UUNet with colleagues in 1996, late 96, 97. So I should have worn my V6 t-shirt that said, been there, done that. But it was that long ago. Um, we got some early, early Cisco beta software and played with V6 then. So V6 for me is kind of boring uh, <laughs> because I've been around it so long. But out of that came all this infrastructure development and support from around the world. 
So there are lots of them. I mean, I, mean, I could talk for probably half the morning going through a lot of the experiences from these. But the most special one for me is this one. Um, this was pretty much the last country in the world to get internet access. So in 1998, the fourth king decided that internet should be available in the country for the 25th anniversary of his coronation. So 2nd of June, 1999. So staff from the ISP came to that workshop in 98. And in March, I got the phone call, the email saying, help, help, please come. We need to get this ISP set up, and we've got three months to do it. And the king has asked for it. So you can't really refuse this type of thing. And of course, it was one of the, you know, it's the modern Shangri-La. Nobody really goes there. It's hard to get in and so forth. It was pretty frantic activity. But, you know, that was the email. <laughs> Please come with a warning that there was no air conditioning in Bhutan. So given this email was in March when it's kind of almost not snowing, I don't know what the air conditioning was about, but anyway. But yeah, beautiful place, and it was a frantic activity. I found this. This was the network diagram that I had proposed. And you look at it and you think, gosh, why would you do something like this? It was a bag of bits. Um, the UNDP program had ordered one or two bits and pieces of devices in, so I really had to try and make best effort of what was there. Um, so 99, it does look messy. You know, we used whatever equipment was already there. 2511, IBM, IBM AIX, anybody remember that? Those were the servers that the UN had ordered. I was like, you've got to be joking. You know, we were using Linux and so forth. And AIX, you couldn't compile anything on it. Anyway, so we made something work. You can almost see the picture on the right there. But we designed and built it as an ISP, whereas the previous um, effort really much was, oh, let's set up an internet cafe. You know, this is not a cafe. You don't have a cafe to run a country. If you look at it today, two and a half gigabits to London, two and a half gigabits to Hong Kong, one gig to Chennai, the national dual stack backbone. We rolled out V6 and for them. When did we do it? 2005, 2006? Um, it's all redundant fiber, radio links. Um, Pop is, you know, all dubbed two of everything. Wide rollout of broadband and mobile data access. Coverage in most districts of the country, even though there are very few roads. Some, a lot of the districts are three, four days walk, yet they have internet. The three competing ISPs, but there's still no internet exchange points. Something I having to want to fix. What else? Well, you know, there's Nepal's exchange point. Um, I'll mention this one quickly. Again, there's several ISPs, no interconnection. And so location was, was easy. Find a tall building. So if you go into Kathmandu, you'll understand. Not, the buildings aren't very high. They looked for the tallest one, so they can actually get wireless access in there. Um, so after the first Sanog meeting, South Sanog is the South Asia Network Operators Group, NPX was launched, established, put in the switch, initial connections. Of course, the National Telecom refused to participate. And there was a bit of hand wring oh, we want everybody in IX, otherwise blah, blah, blah. But actually, it doesn't matter. The independent ISPs all wanted to inter interconnect anyway. So they refused. And so the independence carried on anyway. And there were a lot of problems about wireless interference using 802.11, which is unlicensed, and everybody was trying to use it. And you just turn up the volume to try and drown out everybody else. We did a BGP workshop, of course, but people didn't really have much idea about routing. Our routing knowledge was really limited. So it was quite entertaining. Spent a week with Garab, who used to be a member of the Mino core team, um, driving around Kathmandu. A lot of time in traffic jams, breathing diesel fumes, um, getting AS numbers from Apinake. Um, deploying BGP, as well as a whole heap of other things. It was really almost build the internet with several of the ISPs and get all the peering going. Today, at Nepal Telecom has joined because they realized that they were losing out. Um, all the other ISPs were well interconnected. The telecom with a lot of students and so forth um, getting lots of complaints. The exchange point, 300 megabits per second. Given the country, that's pretty impressive. That's a small country, but 300 megabits per second of traffic. Here's another one. This is the exchange point picture for Bangladesh, for the BDIX. Um, there's still, you know, many countries around the world don't have anything at all. Some are too small, but others are bigger, and the quality of internet and of the internet access is very, very low. Now, I've spent a lot of time over the years helping deploy exchange points in Africa and so on and so forth. Vanuatu, for goodness sake, they have just set up the Vanuatu Internet Exchange. If they can justify an exchange point and see the benefits, virtually everybody else can justify it as well. 
Do you have time for the Mongolia story? Yeah, two minutes. This, this one's good. Right, I had a long association with the Mongolian industry, internet industry. So this was the first workshop I did in 2005. Shipping equipment, the uh, MIAT, the airline, Boeing 737. The workshop kit box, this too big to fit into the hold. So it had to go on Korean Airlines and all the rest. So getting the kit there was a story in itself. But there was this issue, disappearing internet. I got the request to do the workshop because the internet in Mongolia was slowly disappearing. BGP was set up, 2000, an engineer flown in by Cisco, all very well done, but they were experiencing problems. Customer complaints, BBC and CNN and other content websites were slowly disappearing. They couldn't get access. Well, geography, Mongolia is sandwiched between Russia and China. So transit through those countries all by satellite. So get to see the picture. So they were suspicious that the great firewall of China was to blame. Because, you know, BBC, CNN, you, know, you can't really get access. You only get access to certain bits in China. Anything that's critical, you don't get access to. So they thought that they were falling foul of this. They were convinced of it. Because there's not really much love lost between the two countries. The Epstein denied it, of course. They said they got clear channel. So it seemed really unlikely. I mean, it's a nice story, but rather unlikely. And what was happening between 2000 and 2005 was that the registries were distributing new address space. There was a significant growth of the content distribution networks. The BBC wasn't just in London. They were setting up data centers all around the world with new address space, as was CNN, as were everybody else. So the new content networks were using new address space. The disappearing internet was caused by BGP filters put in place in 2000. These were the don't touch BGP, you'll break the internet rules. So they had static routes, filters, blocking all the unused address space. So you go to the IANA website, all the unused address space was in there as a filter, blocking everything. Remove it, the internet became visible. Simple as that. Less than know how much to how fantastic a reason for failure might seem, real reason would be more mundane. So the real reason, lesson, don't use static filters to block unused address space, at least with not, without keeping it up to date. And the other lesson, which is really, really important, learn BGP for yourself rather than outsourcing it. It's not really that hard. So that's the most important bit. And this has really been a lot of my experience over the years. Um, you can look at the rest of the slide set when it goes on the website. You know, the Ghana one was interesting. You know, the vendor fighting each other. But the story goes on. There have been lots and lots of these different experiences. All these people tell me that I don't understand their situation because it's completely different from everybody else's. Everybody is completely different. The Internet is not the same anywhere in the world. You know, there's lots of redesigns. You know, satellites in the Pacific falling out of the sky. That was not much fun. Um, Latency, TCP, window versus performance. People don't believe that satellite links have 600 milliseconds run trip times. Fiber optics being stolen, very, very common through South Asia. People think it's copper. They don't know it. They just see a cable. Oh, I'll take a, a kilometer of it away. Only it's fiber, and you can't do anything with it. North Sea fogs and snow, which block microwave transmission. Hello, cable and wireless. That was, you know, with endless problems with that in Cambridge, which spends most of its time being foggy. Um, this is a favorite one. Philip, you don't understand. And this is the best of them all. You can't change the laws of physics <laughs> to operators and end users who complain about round trip times. Why does it take 100 milliseconds to get from London to New York? Can you not make it go faster? The amount of emails that we got for that type of thing. And if you actually work it out, the speed of light, it's about 60 milliseconds for the speed of light just to get to London and to New York and back. So by the time you think of equipment and everything else in between, Anyway, so that's it. That's been, well, a sum shot of some of the experiences and so forth. But the fundamental bit here, there are a lot of really interesting lessons. A lot of these lessons learned in the early days of trying to keep an internet operations going. So I hope this is what the PC intended. I hope it was interesting and useful. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take a question or two. Otherwise, we'll have a half hour late tea break. Any questions for Philip? I don't think there are any questions from experiences. They're just experiences. You know, I, you know, please don't ask me to write a book. <laughs> yes. There's a, yeah. 
this microphone coming, because we're webcast, so, so the folks online can hear. Thank you. Yes, how, how do you use to, do, uh, to deal with regulatory in these new countries that uh, they really didn't have any uh, set of rules and laws to govern internet, and well, how did you contribute to that? Oh, I mean, it, again, it, it, it's dependent which, which country. I mean, if, if I look at, um, it depend, depends who the regulator is. I mean, I mean some of the, the re regulator level very much look at the telecom market and try and apply that to the internet market. So it, it's really been a case of looking at what some of the issues that they've, they're presenting and how they should be dealt with from the telecom side and then trying to explain how the internet um, side will, will function with it. Um, you know, it's try, trying to think of examples. I mean, I can think of, you know, for example, there's a positive example in Vanuatu um, that I have where the regulator was very, very, um, I think he, he's very, very switched on to enabling competition in his own marketplace. He's very open to opening the whole um, system. And so that was an, an easier conversation to have. In fact, was, the conversation is almost, mm, I don't know if you want to go that far um, in making it all completely liberal in certainly such a, such a small place like that. But it, it really depends on the circumstance. But it's, it's, it's definitely not a case of walking into a regulator and say, you need to do this, you need to do that, and you can't do this. It's, it's a lot of understanding of the reasoning, uh, understanding of the local conditions, because they, you know, they may have a very good reason for doing something that they, they want, to, want to try and do. You know, I've had to deal with things like, oh, should we mandate that everybody does V6 and we turn off V4? And you know, the V6 folks will go, yeah, that's a great thing to do. But the practical reality is, well, how do you get access to the old V4 internet while you're, you're doing the V6 deployment? So it, it has to be a dialogue. It has to be an ongoing conversation to really understand what they're trying to achieve. Anybody else? Wrap up coffee then, I guess. Okay, let's have our coffee break. So, shall we start again at 11.30? We'll run half an hour late. Uh, we'll start again at 11.30. Please, okay. please pick up your t-shirts. They're in the back. Have a chat with our sponsors. And I forgot to mention, if you want to host an Atlas probe, please find uh, Alistair. <laughs>